standing as we read God's word. My name is Rochelle and I'm going to be reading today's sermon scripture. Our reading is going to be from Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 through chapter 3 verse 13. If you'd like to read along in the blue Bibles on your pew, you can find the passage on page 2. <laughs> it's an easy one today. <laughs> Therefore, a man shall leave his, mother, his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, uh, will, you, will you pray with me? Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it speaks to every area of our life. And today, as we look at some of the first pages of scripture, it makes so much sense of our lived experience. God, I pray that as we explore this in Genesis 2 and in Genesis 3 that you would help it to help us make sense of why we want to hide. God, why we are so afraid of vulnerability, of openness with one another, and God, that you would give us the, the strength to risk vulnerability with one another. Knowing that in you, God, we have a safe refuge, that we are forever accepted, and from that, we can, we can risk a real relationship with another human being. <clears throat> so God, would you unite your power with my weak words and help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the things as a dad, uh, and uh, my wife also, actually, she's the one who uh, did this this last week. One of the things that you have to do is 
uh, teach your kids about the world around them, right? They come into the world knowing nothing, uh, and they assume a lot of things about the world around them, and uh, it's our job as parents to try to teach them uh, how to interact with the world around them. And this last week, uh, my wife, Courtney, was trying to do that uh, by teaching my daughter. So I have a daughter who's five and a son who's two. Uh, and so my daughter, who's five, uh, she's a very social person. Uh, she loves to be around other people. If she's at the park, she's gonna try to meet a new kid. Uh, and I love that about her. Uh, but that also really scares me because um, she's a very trusting person. <laughs> Naturally, just socially, she wants to meet new people. And so we've been trying to kind of coach her and teach her uh, on how to interact with strangers. Uh, and this last week, uh, we taught her how to interact with strangers with a sense of caution, right? Uh, and so uh, Courtney was, was teaching her, hey, uh, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I got some candy, you should come check it out, what do you do? And she got the answer right. She said, no, and run. She, that's what she does. We teach her, no, and run. <laughs> that's how she remembers. Okay, so if, if mommy and daddy uh, get hurt at the house or something happens to us, what do you do? Uh, she's like, I go to Miss Jess's house, I knock on the door, say, I need help. That's right. Okay, if a stranger comes up to you and says, hey, I have some puppies in my van, you should come see them. What do you do? I go see the puppies. <laughs> that's what she said. I, of course, like candy, no, that's fine. But puppies, I'll go see that. And uh, we had to teach her, no, it's no and run. And she was very confused by it. And so we had to explain to her, like, the person probably doesn't have, have puppies, and which confused her even more. Like, why would they tell me they want to show me puppies if they don't have puppies? And oh my gosh, it was, it was an experience trying to help her to see that not everyone is trustworthy, right? Uh, that's, that's a funny story of, of something we all have to learn. Something we all have to sort out for ourselves and figure out a, a question that we have to ask ourselves, and even once we figure out the answer to that question, we often come back and reconsider that answer. The question is this, who can I trust? Who can I trust? Over time, we, we all learn the qualifications we look for in trustworthy people, right? We look for that, we, we learn what it's like to trust someone, and, and unfortunately, we, we learn also what it's like to have that trust broken. And in fact, from, from day one of your life, you've been asking that very question, who can I trust? So in, in psychology, there, there's a framework they use to understand the behavior of children and how that behavior translates into their adult life. And it's a framework called attachment styles or attachment theory. And attachment theory is, is a psychological and ethological theory that analyzes relationships between human beings, and, and one of the core tenets of that theory is that in order for a child to develop emotionally and socially, they need to develop a strong attachment to at least one caregiver throughout their youngest years. And so one of the main proponents of attachment theory was a guy by the name of Dr. John Bowlby, uh, and he summarized attachment under four main characteristics. First, Proximity maintenance, uh, which is just the desire to be near to people that we are attached to. Safe haven, which is returning to the caregiver for comfort and safety when we're afraid or when we face a threat. Secure base, which is when the, the caregiver acts as a secure base from which the child can explore their surrounding environment. And then finally, separation anxiety, which is the anxiety that happens when the caregiver is absent. Now, there's a lot within those characteristics, but they mostly come down to this. Can I trust the caregiver? Is the caregiver going to be near? Proximity. Is the caregiver going to provide comfort when I'm afraid? Is the caregiver going to be an anchor that allows me to explore my surroundings? And when the caregiver is gone, can I trust that they will come back? From day one, your life has revolved around that question, who can I really trust? And friends, the, the lived experience of these questions that I just went through in your own personal life, they have shaped how you relate to other people. Your experience of trust, or lack thereof from your parents or caregiver, shaped how you are connecting with someone today. From day one, answering the question of trust is critical. Answering the question of who you can and cannot trust 
determines every aspect of your relationships. But the problem that I see, both in myself and in so many others, is that we just don't want to trust. And so our whole life is, sure, built on this question of trust, but we aren't comfortable with it. We're self-made people, right? I mean, we're adults here, we're strong, we're independent, we're capable. Why would you stick your neck out and trust the state of your heart to another human being? Why would we risk trusting? Or even when we do risk trusting, it's, it's often what Dr. Paul Tripp calls probationary trust. It's not wholehearted, but reserved. It's not risky, but calculated. It's not vulnerable, it is insulated. Even in our most intimate relationships like marriage, we measure out our trust based on how comfortable we are with the risk of hurt. Friends, all of us would much rather do exactly what Adam and Eve do here in this text, hide. We don't want to trust, we want to hide. But the the, the call today will be to stop hiding to stop shielding, embrace the risk of vulnerability to another person, because without that, friends, there is no relationship of depth and connection. That's what we wanna do today, to have the courage to risk vulnerability and to resist our impulse to hide. And and to help you get there, to help you answer that call, I wanna explore really this origin story of our penchant for hiding. And so we're gonna, we're gonna look at this text and see why it is that we so love to hide from one another and, and how we can maybe accept the risk of vulnerability, okay? Let's jump in. So, so the text that Rochelle read uh, picks up in paradise. God had, had just finished creating the heavens and the earth and he planted Adam and Eve into a lush garden that's been cultivated by God himself. That sounds wonderful. Just before this, God had officiated the wedding of Adam and Eve. Things are great. Paradise has been established. And at the end of chapter two, we read that Adam and Eve were naked with one another and felt no shame. Now, I think it's interesting to me that that the writer chose to use that description, felt no shame. Out of the panoply of emotions or experiences that he could have used, he chose that. Not just that they were happy together. Not even that they were just connected. Not just that they were joyful, peaceful, safe, abundant, satisfied. The writer of Genesis, moved along by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes down and records this description. That Adam and Eve are completely open to one another while being completely unashamed in front of one another. And this is, I think, meant to be instructive and teaches us this, that the original design for human beings was meant to be characterized by a complete lack of shame. What what was a human being supposed to be? What would it look like for them to image God like Genesis 2 talks about? It seems that one of the core pieces of that would, to be, would be to be completely free from insecurity. No shame, nothing to hide, nothing to be afraid of. This is what we were meant for, and this is why you want what you want in a relationship, right? Oh, you want this. You want a relationship that's free from shame because you know you were made for it, but despite being made for it, we never seem to find it, right? And that's because of how things are ruptured in chapter three. Now, I know that this scene of Adam and Eve being tempted by the serpent is well known. Uh, many of us would have read this story, heard this story before, but, but I want to explore really not just the actions of sin that we so often focus on, not just the actions of sin that were taken, but also I, I wanna look together at really the patterns of thinking that developed into Adam and Eve through this interaction. Because, because it's these patterns of thinking that Adam and Eve suffer from here because of the temptation of the serpent. These are the things that have been downloaded into every generation, and these patterns are actually what cut off the possibility for connection and make us not want to trust anyone. These are the patterns we fall into. So so we're told at the beginning of, of chapter three 
that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Now, later in scripture, we, we learn that this serpent, serpent is representative of Satan himself, right? Who is the great deceiver, and in this scene, he does just that. He deceives. That the serpent here has a, has a dark shrewdness that is used to deceive these two into ways of thinking and then eventually acting that rupture the relationship between them two and between them and God. And what is the, what is the craftiness that the serpent uses? Sowing distrust in the relationship. The craftiness, the dark shrewdness of the serpent that's trying to get them to be separated from one another and separated from God, what he's using to do that is sow distrust into the relationship. That's how he's gonna accomplish separation and alienation, first between Adam and Eve and then between them and God. So, so l- let me walk you through it. Notice, notice with me his first question. Did God really say? Did God really say that? So this initial question already introduces the possibility of doubt. But what kind of doubt? Well, first, a a, a doubting of Eve about herself. She's basically, she basically is being asked whether she's remembering things correctly. We, we aren't given the, the time frame around when the serpent asked this question. We have no idea how long it's actually been since God commanded them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and where they are now. But, but what this question does is introduce doubt to Eve about herself. Is, did God really say that? Is she remembering correctly? Is her memory of such an important command trustworthy? She begins to doubt herself, but more than introducing a doubt about herself, it also introduces a doubt about Adam. I mean, think about it with me. If you remember, the the command that God gave was given to Adam before Eve was made. So, it was presumably Adam's job to go and tell Eve what God said after Eve was made. As they lived their lives in that perfection of the garden, surely Adam would have communicated with her that this special tree called the knowledge of good and evil was off limits. But here the serpent is asking Eve, did God really say that? In other words, did Adam get it right? Did Adam get it right? Eve only knows as much about this command as Adam relayed to her, and so the question introduces relational doubt. Did Adam tell me the truth? Did he he leave something out? It seems like this serpent maybe knows something that I don't. Did Adam not tell me something? Did Adam not clue me in on what is actually here? Is Adam's transmission of the command trustworthy? And underneath that question, is Adam trustworthy? Can I trust him? Friends, already before actions are even taken, Eve is introduced to the possibility of distrust. Distrust both toward herself and distrust toward the reliability of Adam. And at that, the serpent goes deeper. Next, the the serpent introduces doubt about God and his intentions. So after Eve answers his question, the serpent flatly and plainly rejects the answer. No, you will not surely die. In fact, Eve, God said don't do that because when you do, he knows that you will be like him. Now the temptation for Adam and Eve here is not just that they will be like God. I think we we, we often read our own experiences into a text like these, but remember, this is before sin had corrupted the human heart and bent it away from God. This is before all of that. So the temptation here is not alluring just because it's connecting with Adam and Eve's desire to be like God. I mean, they kind of already are. They're made in the image of God. No, the the danger of the serpent's claim is not just that Adam and Eve would want to be like God, but that it would introduce the idea that God did not want them to be like him. The, the, the craftiness here of the serpent is not so much the offer to be like God, but is the, the introduction of a relational question. Why doesn't God want you to be like him? 
The serpent's not enticing them just out of their desire to be like God, but is more introducing, putting in front of them the question, hmm, God knows something you don't. Why didn't he tell you that? God knows that when you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. Huh, I wonder why he doesn't want you to be like him. Maybe you're not as important to him as you thought. Maybe he doesn't want to be as connected to you like you thought. The serpent gets them to ask themselves whether God is trustworthy or not. Oh, friends, it introduces rupture between them and God because it introduces doubt about God's intention for them. God doesn't want you to be like him. He's holding out on you. More than that, he, if he really wanted to be as close and connected with you as it seems, surely he would be okay with you being like him, right? Again, you must not be as important to him as you thought because clearly he's looking out for himself and not you. That's the hook of the serpent's question. Before any action is taken by these two, relational trust is beginning to crack. Can they trust each other? Even more, can they trust God? Are they as important to him as they thought? If they are, why would he be holding out on them? And as the story goes, and as we tragically know, they take the temptation to distrust God. They bite on that hook and the whole house comes tumbling down. I mean, the text says that, 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 that they are all of a sudden aware of their nakedness, meaning they, they suddenly feel shame. It says that their eyes were opened. What just a few verses earlier was the crown jewel description of mankind, it's now been tarnished. The contagion of shame has been downloaded into the human heart and now they feel relationally afraid. Now they feel afraid. They are naked in front of one another and all of a sudden they don't want to be. They're afraid. And so friends, they, they, they get to hiding, right? And their strategies of hiding because of their shame, because of their guilt are the same ones we use today. Not only has the contagion of shame been downloaded into our heart, but also the patterns of hiding we have also inherited from these first parents. I mean, first, they, they hide by withholding from one another the parts of themselves that are most sensitive to be seen, right? They, they put on loincloths, and I think it's pretty clear from the text, they are not making a three-piece suit here, right? There's no sweaters, there's no jackets, they aren't trying to completely hide their bodies from one another. Rather, they hide only the pieces that they feel most sensitive about. Only those pieces that they feel most sensitive about are they concerned to hide from the other person. And what Adam and Eve did physically, we do emotionally and relationally. I mean, some of us, you heard me open this sermon and you hear the idea of hiding from those we are closest with and we just reject that as something that, yeah, we don't practice that. I mean, maybe we're relatively open and honest. Maybe we practice what seems like a strong measure of vulnerability. Very few of us are completely distant. Very few of us are completely shut down. But friends, even fewer of us are actually vulnerable. Oh, we, we all cut off these specific pieces of us and our story that are most sensitive. Those you're closest with, like in marriage, they don't see the real you. You hide that piece of you. So they've never heard that story. They've never heard or been let into that wound They've never known that struggle. There's something that you're holding back, something that you're choosing to cover because you're most sensitive about that piece of your story. And it should go without saying that hiding the most sensitive parts of us from those we are closest with shuts down the depth of connection we want. I mean, to continue with Adam and Eve here, Friends, the physical parts they cover were the parts that would have embodied the deep connection of sexual intercourse, right? 
the parts that they hid from one another were originally the physical parts that should have connected them together. The same is true here. The emotional parts you hide from one another, oh, friends, those are the ones that are actually most charged with the potential for connection. But we, we hold them back. Second, another aspect of their hiding is that they repurpose what God has given them in order for them to hide. I mean, this this might seem like a small detail, but the writer in chapter three makes clear that when they hear God walking in the garden, they hide among the trees of the garden. Seems like a small detail, but friends, the, the dense abundance of the garden that was originally given to them for their enjoyment has now been repurposed to become a strategy at hiding. Those trees were meant to be enjoyed, not huddled behind. But here they are repurposing that. Those leaves that they tore off a tree and made into loincloths, those were meant to be enjoyed, not repurposed for them to hide. They take God's gifts to them and turn them into something that will serve their hiding from one another and God. Surely none of us know what that's like, right? None of us like lead with our strengths, right? None of us use our strengths in order to shroud our shame? Gosh, no, of course we do. We use God's gifts that were given to us that were meant to be enjoyed by us and those around us, and we repurpose them as tools to hide our shame. We use God's gifts to mask our weakness and insecurity. So again, we put our, we put our best foot forward with one another, and we use that to hide our weakness. We emphasize our strengths in order to shroud our weaknesses. And so, friends, our our money that God has given all of a sudden mask our emotional poverty. Our strong values and our character mask our weak and pathetic love. We use our strengths to cover our weaknesses, to hide from one another. I, I do this too. One thing that I'm kind of good at is understanding the emotions of another person. Hopefully that's true. Courtney, you can tell me afterward. Oh, she's not in here anymore. Never mind. (laughs) I think I'm mostly attuned to other people's emotions. But you know what I do in that strength? Hey, let's talk about you. (laughs) Let's let's talk about you. Let's talk about your emotions. What are you feeling right now? How, how, How are you doing? And that's a strength, that's a strength to be attuned to the emotions of others, but so often it's used in purpose of like, don't ask me about my emotions. <laughs> don't ask me about my weakness, what I feel insecure about. So let, let's just talk about you. We use our strengths in order to hide our weaknesses. And, and finally, they hide by rejecting God's invitation into honesty and openness. I mean, God... God actually gives them the opportunity to come clean. He actually gives them that opportunity. We read God's approaching them and questioning them as somehow accusative, but I I don't think that's completely God's intention here. God is instead laying out the opportunity for them to come clean. He, He asks a question in order to create the opportunity for them to be open and honest with him. But instead, they choose to play the the, the blame game, right? They won't admit, they won't own up, they won't confess. Instead, they identify someone else as the reason for their distrust. The woman you gave me, God, she's the one who gave me the fruit. The serpent, he's the one who tricked me. Instead of responding to God's invitation to actually open up and confess what has happened, they shut down, they hide. They've been hiding this whole time and God comes to them, seeks them, asks them to be open and honest and still they hold him at arm's length. They reject the invitation of vulnerability. This is the origin story of our penchant for hiding. This is where it all began. This is when we learned together as mankind to 
to run from one another, to hide from one another, and to hide from God. It's, it's so easy to be suspicious of another person and of God because the virus of distrust has been downloaded into the human heart from our first parents. That's what's gone wrong. And so the nagging question is this, how do we get out of this? How, how, do, how do we get out of this? I mean, we all want connection, right? None of us really want to hide. We want the depth and connection, so what do, we, what do we do? I have a really simple and terrifying answer for you. At some point, you are going to have to embrace the risk of vulnerability. No hacks, no relational hacks to depth and connection. <laughs> No relational hacks to get out of the habit of hiding. You are going to have to embrace the risk. Oh, and what, what a risk it is <laughs> to open up and to, and to share. We have to embrace vulnerability. And now, friends, vulnerability is, is actually not just the opposite of hiding. It's also its healing antidote. In every way that hiding deforms us, vulnerability reforms us. I mean, first, vulnerability heals oh, just the exhaustion of hiding. I mean, you, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about because you've experienced this. But hiding from another person intentionally takes a great amount of energy, Oh, it just, it sucks the energy out of you. You can't do it for long. To tell a half-truth, to maintain a charade, to keep up an image is exhausting. I mean, David, even in, in what Kyle read earlier, he says that in Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit is no deceit. For when I kept silent... My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Oh, hiding just exhausts us. It doesn't just cut off connection to another person, but it also kills us personally. It's exhausting, but vulnerability relieves that. And, and second, vulnerability heals the lies of hiding. We, we all hide because we're believing that we have to, right? even though many of us maybe don't want to. The, the shame that causes us to hide is deeply afraid of rejection. Fear, even in the text, is, is exactly what Adam points to in this text about why he hid from God. He knew he was naked, and the shame of his nakedness made him afraid of rejection. But what's so tragic is that the shame that causes us to fear rejection actually leads us into the isolation we are so afraid of. The privacy fences that, that we erect to protect ourselves, they also preclude us from the relationship to the person whom you are seeking protection from. Shame makes us fear rejection and then almost guarantees our isolation and loneliness. But vulnerability can heal the lie behind that fear. It can heal that story. It's a powerful thing and a healing thing to have, one, have someone see the raw parts of who you are and not run. I mean, I, I remember this for myself when uh, probably like eight years ago, I went through a, uh, uh, this program called Steps, which is basically like a, uh, a gospel-influenced uh, thing of the 13 Steps of AA. Uh, and as you go through that program, one of the things you have to do is uh, take what's called an inventory. And an inventory is, is within different categories, uh, everything. <laughs> everything that you've, not, you know, you don't have to detail every single thing you've done, but the things that weigh you down and the things that have been done to you that weigh you down. And you share this inventory. Anybody want to do this? <laughs> Yikes, no. You share this inventory with a, a trusted mentor and friend. And, and I'll never forget going through one of those sections of the inventory, and uh, my mentor, the way that he had me do it is just dump it all out there. So I just read everything to him. He didn't ask me to pause. He didn't ask more questions. It was just a time for me to dump everything that I had done that I had been carrying on my shoulders. And, and I'll never forget sitting there and, and watching Brian Vinson with a puzzled look just genuinely say, is that it? <laughs> 
And I was like, are you listening? <laughs> Did you listen to what I just said, Brian? He had, but it wasn't making him move. It wasn't something that surprised him. It wasn't that was going to make him run. It wasn't something that was going to bring rejection for me. And that was one of the most healing moments of my life. To dump it all out there and for the other person to not be moved. It is a healing thing. And, and not even just emotionally, but even psychologically. There is this wonderful thing, friends, called neuroplasticity where the brain literally changes with the stimuli and experience around it. And the physical, friends, the physical and chemical makeup of your brain actually changes when you experience someone knowing you but not rejecting you. The parts of your brain that are built for connection shift and light up. Vulnerability is a relieving, healing antidote to hiding. And it's what we're all invited into. In our marriages, in our closest friendships, to be vulnerable with one another. Share openly and in risk. <laughs> but to close, I want to point out an important aspect of all of this and somewhat of an interesting detail when it concerns all this. That throughout the Bible, I hope this doesn't undo everything I've said before this. <laughs> throughout the Bible, not once are you commanded to trust another human being. Like literally, not once. Go look. You are never commanded to trust another human being. Now, now, trust is definitely commended to you. There are all kinds of ways that the Bible paints relationships that would be impossible apart from trust. I mean, go read Song of Solomon. None of that's happening without some real trust. But though it commends trust for the flourishing of relationship, it never commands it. And that's because to command trust in anyone other than God would be leading us toward disappointment. We should cultivate trust with one another. We should seek it without a doubt. We should do the hard work of vulnerability so that we can really connect with them. But the depths of our trust should be reserved for God alone. The Bible's message is that God alone is worthy of our complete trust. God alone, and it's actually by having our ultimate trust in God that we can even begin to measure out trust to another person. Everything that I've talked about now won't really happen unless our trust has been rested in God. When we place our hope in God for fulfillment, for emotional well-being, for satisfaction and peace, we are given a safe haven in God that can allow us to risk trusting another person. I mean, to go back to what I said at the beginning about attachment theories, one of the characteristics, safe haven. What does that mean? Having someone you can return to as a secure anchor point for you to explore the surrounding environment. That's God. The safe haven relationally that allows you to actually begin to risk vulnerability with another person is knowing that you have an anchor that you can go back to that you know God is trustworthy. We can run to God and, and we won't be let down. We won't be left alone. This is the anchor of hope for our souls. This is it. Because we know that in Christ, we're as accepted and safe as we ever could ask for. Because Jesus Christ was rejected and even vulnerable on our behalf, Friends, I know historically painters don't really paint the real picture of Christ, but he didn't have a loincloth on. He was subjected to our real vulnerability and he took on our shame. Jesus took that on himself in the cross so that everything we have to be insecure about, everything that makes us feel dirty, Jesus placed it on himself so that we don't have to hide. We no longer have to cover ourselves in hiding because Jesus took on the punishment of our sin as he hung there physically and spiritually vulnerable, which won for us a safe place in the heart of God. 
If you wanna be vulnerable with another person, if you wanna risk trust with another human being, and again, I wanna emphasize that word risk because manna is, you better have your heart anchored in the love and trustworthiness of God. Friends, this is, this is the gospel. I mean, listen, if you're new here and, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I just wanna tell you, this is why we're here. <laughs> This is why we're in this room. It's not anything else but the gospel. We're here because unlike every other religion, Christianity guarantees a home in the heart of God. Every other religion, including the secular way of life, friends, it ultimately comes down to just crossing your fingers, hoping against hope that you're gonna find that one person who will know you completely and not run. Christianity doesn't make you cross your fingers. It guarantees that for you. And that's our hope, that we have a home in the heart of God and he's not going anywhere. He knows you, he sees you down to the bottom and he doesn't flinch. He doesn't wince, he doesn't shy away. God goes there to the raw parts of you and he stays there. In love and in kindness, he comforts you, he gives you security, he's washed you and made you safe from the blood of Jesus Christ. Everything you hope for relationally with another person needs not be hoped for any longer. It's been guaranteed in Christ. That's our hope, friends. That's our safety. To have God as a fortress who satisfies our desire for depth and connection, who gives us a safe place to run to, to be open about, And from that safety even gives us the courage to begin to risk with another human being. You wanna wanna connect with someone else? You wanna connect better in your marriage? It's gonna happen through vulnerability. You wanna be vulnerable? Hope in God. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have provided a a space for us to be safe, unashamed, unafraid. It's not because we've done anything. It's not because we've gotten better. It's not because of anything we have done or ever could hope to do, but it's It's because your son, Jesus, has taken on the punishment and the payment for our sin. This thing in Genesis 3 that corrupted everything in the beginning, Jesus has overcome that by embracing our penalty and taking on our vulnerability. And because of that, vulnerability is now a way of life. It's actually a way of healing. God, would you convince us of that? And would you help us to to know the safety that we have in you? To uncover all of the parts of our story and of our hearts that we are so afraid of and most sensitive about. To uncover those before you and not see you wince. Not see you flinch and not see you shy away. God, help us to experience that now. Help us to confess our sins to you. Help us to confess our wounds to you and experience the great healing power of your grace and your faithfulness, God. In Jesus' name, amen. This teaching was recorded as part of our current sermon series at Icon Church. During our weekly gatherings, we move from the teaching to a time of response. While we recognize it may be hard to capture that as you listen online, We encourage you to take a moment to reflect on and respond to what the Spirit might be telling you in response to it. For more resources and to find out how you can join with us in gathering on Sundays, visit iconchurch.org. And as we say each week, Christ is all and we are His.